Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar by x Rite Pantone. Our expert will guide you through the steps to define a realistic pass-fail tolerance. My name is Jessica Hilaert, and I am Marketing Manager with x Rite. I will be your webinar moderator for today. During the webinar, we will keep everyone muted. However, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24, 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. I would like to introduce our presenter of today's webinar, Colin Wakeford. Colin gained an MPhil in color chemistry from Harriet Watt University and since then has amassed 30 years of experience in the color industry. As an application engineer for Greta Macbeth and then x Rite, Colin works across various industries, including paint, ink, and textiles. And now I give the word to Colin, wishing you all a very interesting webinar. Hi, Colin. Uh, good morning, um, or should I say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I think we have quite a, a wide uh, range of uh, attendees today. So, uh, hello and uh, welcome to uh, the Realistic Pass-Fail Tolerance uh, presentation. So, um, as probably all of us know in our different industries, colour is becoming increasingly important. Our customers are becoming more literate about color um, their expectations are becoming higher uh, across the plastics textiles ink coatings and, and many other industries as well research has shown that uh, people will make up their minds about the purchases within about one and a half minutes of the initially looking at the products and 90 percent of this will be based on the color uh, specifically so first uh, question to our attendees for today. Um, how do you assess color? Are you doing it visually, using instrumentation, or are you doing a combination of visual and instrumental uh, color assessment? Okay, we're launching the poll question. Everybody, you have a few seconds to answer. Okay, let's wait. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, I'm closing the poll and we can analyze the results. Here you go. Colleen, can you see the results? Uh, no, not at the moment. Do uh... We have 88% that are using both, 6% visually and 6% instrumentation. Okay. Uh, well, that's, uh, it means that the next few slides will be quite familiar to uh, the majority of the, our, our audience today, which is, uh, is good. Um, and obviously, uh, for one or two of you, uh, it will be new. So, We're okay, back Jessica, do I have? Yeah, oh, you okay. can go on. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, color measurement metrics. So, if we are doing instrumental color assessment. Uh, what numbers are we looking at? What scales are we talking about? So uh, probably for many of you, you will be familiar with the C-Lab um, equation, which has probably been the most commonly used across most industries since uh, the late 1970s. So here we have um, 1976, the CIE uh, published the, the C-Lab color space. A uh, three-dimensional space into which all colors we can see can be plotted in terms of the uh, lightness, red, green, and yellow-blue coordinates. 
obviously within this space we can also uh, describe these coordinates again in terms of lightness but also the chroma or saturation and the hue angle so um, just to illustrate that these uh, values these sea lab values if we uh, obviously we measure the uh, spectral reflectance using our spectrophotometer that is if you like the the raw data that data is then manipulated using uh, this illuminance that we have chosen to assess the color under. In this case, we have D65 and the uh, standard observer function. Obviously, that depends whether we are a, a printer um, working within print packaging, for example, who would use a two degree standard observer. But most of the rest of us who are in textiles, paint, plastics, uh, and other industries would use a 10 degree standard observer. Obviously, there's also a number of different daylight standards. So again, uh, depending on the industry we are in, that may differ very slightly. So we have to be very clear when we are setting tolerances that we establish and make very clear in our supply chain exactly what color equation we're using, also the standard observer function, and the, uh, the exact luminant or range of luminance we're looking at under. So here we have a color. Um, under 10 degree standard observer D65 with a, a lightness value of 39.9, uh, A star value of 48.03, which means it's very red, and a B star of 17.17. Again, it's in the positive direction, so it's a yellow. So even if we did not see the color swatch, we could say here that we have a color which is, is in the red area and probably yellow shade red. So we have numbers which allow us to communicate on a, a simple level with each other the type of color we're talking about. Obviously, what this also helps us to do is to check how a color will appear under a number of different lighting, con uh, in this case, lighting conditions, um, which is the, uh, we refer to as metamorism. There are different types of metamorism, but today we'll concentrate purely on uh, changing the luminant. So here we have a plastic bottle under uh, D65 daylight on the left-hand side and cool white fluorescent or F2 on the right-hand side. And we can assess by purely looking at the numbers or using a light box or both, uh, whether this color will change significantly as we change uh, lighting conditions. So if we look at the numbers here, we can see under daylight we have the uh, C-Lab values. And under cool white fluorescent, the L-star value is almost exactly the same. The B-star value, the uh, yellow-blue, again is very similar, but we have a significant change in the A-star. We've gone from 48.03 to 37.77. So this bottle will appear 10 units less red under the fluorescent light. So obviously, if the the uh, specification is for a very bright red under a fluorescent shop lighting, then uh, this formula that we're working with probably is not suitable. We'd have to look at um, a formulation that maybe has a, a more uh, vivid uh, red or more yellow shade red, for example, in the formula to maintain that um, uh, intensity of the red color. Okay, if we look at these three dimensions, the L star, A star, and B star, in the three-dimensional space, if we compare two color points, we've got a delta L star, a delta A star, a delta B star, and if we, uh, using the C-Lab equation, which gives us the square root of the sum of the squares of these three dimensions, we get the delta E star, or, uh, well, the color difference. Again, we have to be quite specific here because, unfortunately, the color scientists, in their wisdom, have uh, used delta E for all the color equations, uh, delta E standing for color difference, but we then have to be sure that we're talking Talking about uh, Delta E star, uh, C lab, uh, or Delta E 76, as some people refer to it, or some of the other equations which we will touch on uh, later in the presentation. So, one thing to be 
careful of when we're using instrumental color assessment is that the delta E, the color difference, only tells us how big the color difference is. It doesn't tell us what makes up that color difference. To do that, we have to look at the individual delta L star, delta A star, delta B star. As we can see in this example, we have a delta E of 2.28, but that would just tell us if our tolerance was set at one or uh, two, um, then that would be uh, a fail. If we had a delta E uh, star of maybe five, then that would be a pass. Obviously, if it's a fail, it becomes more critical. What is making that color difference? So we can look at the L star, A star, and B star differences here. We can see that uh, we have uh, a delta L star of minus 1.7, a delta B star of minus 1.5, and a delta uh, B star of 0.45. Um, actually, if I look at that, it's, uh, yeah, the delta L star is saying that it's darker. Um, we've got a slight typo there. Um, the delta A star saying that it's 1.45 less red, and it's slightly more yellow. So the, the main issues here are the L star and the A star. So we could go back to the laboratory, and with that information, then make an adjustment to the formulation. So, actual tolerancing itself. So, I've, I've touched on very uh, well the different types of color scales. Uh, if we stick to um, the C Lab system within the C Lab space, here we have on the right side um, the, uh, the A star and the B star axes and the uh, if you like the color circle, we can look at point A as being um, obviously the L star comes out of the screen and uh, through the screen. So we're not seeing that uh, third dimension in this particular schematic, but we have a, an L star of 50 units. So that would be out of the screen towards us, an A star of nine. So it's slightly towards the red side and a B star of 54, very much uh, in the yellow direction. Alternatively, we can look at that as, again, the L star being the same, but the C star, the chroma, which is the vector from the neutral point out to the A uh, point of 54.7. The higher the C value is, the more chromatic or stronger the color will be. And then we have a hue angle of 80.5. Zero is red, and if we work anti-clockwise around the color circle, we go through all the other colors within the spectrum. And similarly for point B, the L star is common to, to both of these uh, descriptions. We have an A star of 50, again, uh, in this case, very red. We have a C, uh, which is 54.6, so a, a similar chrome strength of color as the point A, although we're talking red here rather than a yellow. And the B star, 22 and uh, also the, the hue angle of 23.8, which means it's, it's much closer to that uh, red um, uh, axis. So we can use LCH for high chroma colors and LAB can be used for more achromatic colors. If we compare these two color spaces, the importance comes when we actually set tolerances within it. The C lab space gives us rectangular tolerancing. One thing that was shown very early in the uh, life of the C lab um, color difference is that the human eye does not pick up colors uh, rectangularly. So there is a certain degree of error between what we will see visually in the light box and what the mathematics will report as a pass or fail. One way to try and uh, eliminate some of this error is to look at the LCH, which is, um, well, unfortunately, this is a very American word, which my accent has great difficulty getting around, but it's a trapeze shape rather than a, a rectangular shape. And then uh, the delta E works in a spherical tolerance. So we have three different spaces there, all of which will not necessarily, you know, 
overlap 100%. As I said before, the human eye has got elliptical sensitivity. So in this case, if we were in a yellow, uh, which is we are uh, quite uh, forgiving in um, our visual uh, pass fail would include almost all of these different shapes. But obviously, in a more critical area of color space, the uh, mathematical solutions might fall outside of the area the eye would be uh, would say a pass in and uh, or a fail. So if we set that delta E too large, obviously uh, you can see here there's a, a quite a big area where the mathematics would say pass, and visually uh, we wouldn't. So as you can see here, if we use the L star, A star, B star tolerances, that rectangular box is significantly larger than the visual um, ellipse. If we use LCH, as, as you can see, we still a, a degree of error, but it's much, much smaller. OK, um, this might help inform me uh, going into the next few slides, which to uh, concentrate on. What type of tolerancing uh, are you guys using at the moment? Is it the rectangular or trapezoid, um, the spherical or the elliptical tolerancing? Okay, thanks, Colin. I'm launching, launching the poll. All right, let's give a few seconds to our audience. All right, a few more seconds. Okay, people are still voting. All right, okay, I'm gonna close. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll and we're gonna analyze the results. All right, so I'm sharing the results. Colleen, can you see it? Unfortunately, no. Uh, okay, so we have uh, the highest rate is 45% spherical, and then we have 27% for elliptical and 27% for rectangular trapezoidal. Okay. Well, well that's an interesting spread. That's. Uh... Okay, we're, we're back to your presentation. If you can, okay. if you want to comment. I, I say that's interesting. Um, maybe everyone was struggling to understand what the questions meant, but uh, that suggests that we've got a lot of people using, uh, well, my take on it is a lot of people using Delta E um, as a, a sole uh, arbiter of pass fail. Um, Obviously, some people using elliptical have moved on to, as we shall see in the next few slides, some of them, uh, the advancements have been made in the mathematics since uh, the CLAP uh, color equation came in, uh, in like the late 1970s. So let's move to the next slide. Elliptical tolerance uh, improvements. Uh, as I said before, we had the, the C-Lab mathematics were published 1976. Uh, very quickly, it was uh, seen that there were limitations using the, the tolerancing on the L star, A star, B star, how it did not agree um, very closely with our um, vision. Uh, ironically, that had been discovered way back in the 1940s with experiments that were done in America that uh, determined that our human pass-fail perception was elliptical. So um, obviously different industries with uptake of uh, instrumental color measurement uh, at different times, uh, there was a, a certain degree of politics, I guess, was involved in that with different equations being offered within different industries, especially in the textile industry, some of the, um, the end users had their own bespoke equations, which they would uh, offer to their suppliers, uh, but were not readily available to non-suppliers, let's say. Uh, and then the paint industry was using uh, 
uh, probably working with C-Lab a bit more. It wasn't really until into the 1980s that new equations started to come to the fore that used the elliptical tolerancing. Um, the, the foremost one of those being the CMC color different equation as published uh, or developed by the Society of Dyers and Colors here in the UK. Um, one, the two things that that equation looked to overcome was one, the elliptical tolerancing versus rectangular, but also that our eye is more critical in certain areas of color space than in others. This diagram here shows to a certain degree that certain areas of color space here are bigger than others. Um, we can see here our eye is very forgiving in the yellow region. So if you have a color and you try to match it and you are on the yellow side of that color, you can go a long way yellower and the human eye will not pick it up. If you go slightly to the blue side, yeah, it will scream at you uh, a fail. But on the same, uh, on the other side, if we look in a gray, so we have a, a delta E here of uh, three in a bright yellow, it's invisible, as I say. And that would, in, uh, in the CMC equation, would equate to a delta E that was probably less than one based on the mathematics there. If we look at a gray for that delta E of three, huge difference. And the delta, uh, the C lab equation, um, sorry, the CMC equation would uh, give us a much higher value. Each of these ellipses in the right hand diagram equate to a CMC delta E of one unit. So you can see around the periphery, they are very large and quite fat ellipses. As we get to the center, they get much, much smaller. So we're getting much more critical as we get towards the neutral point. So a nice little slide here, which is showing the uh, agreement between the mathematics and the visual. C-Lab, as you say here, um, or CIE uh, 76, as, as some of the people within the printing fraternity are probably more familiar, we only have 75% agreement between the mathematics and the visual. Now, if you're working in, in uh, a lot of colors that are quite, uh, uh, say deco paint, for example, a lot of paint companies find that C-Lab works okay for them. Uh, they don't get too many um, dis disagreements between the visual and the instrumental. And if they do, if they're aware of this limitation, they can still work well with this equation. But obviously, if people are not so familiar with the limitations, then this could be a big problem. We then move through to the CMC, and we've put here CMC two to one. Uh, this is just the CMC comes, can be set up as CMC two to one or a one to one ratio, which basically allows a weighting factor on the lightness. It was determined when this was first written that when we look at a color match, when we tolerance a color, we do two things. We say, can we see a color difference? Yes or no. And if we can, is it an acceptable color difference? For many people, a perfect match is, is either seen as not, not achievable, which is, is quite realistic, but there is a certain degree that we can accept uh, or not. So a two to one, which is typically used within the textile industry, where they work to an acceptable color difference, we have about 95% agreement with the visual. The paint industry normally, in, if the UCMC will work to a one-to-one -one ratio where lightness becomes more critical and therefore um, our color, color differences will be much tighter. And of course, the, the most recent uh, CIE uh, standard is the CIE 2000, uh, which we have over 95% um, agreement with the, the visual. Now, all three of these, C-Lab, CMC, Delta E 2000, my personal experience is that all three of those are currently used within uh, the industry, certainly the industries that I work in. C-Lab has been around since uh, for like 35, 45 years now. It's used quite widely. Uh, if it's used correctly, uh, that can be quite successful. CMC probably has obviously significant improvements over C-Lab. And there's been quite a lot of uptake in the last 10 to 15 years. CIE 2000, 
much newer equation. I think the CIE only actually published it as a standard in 2013. So it's much newer, much uh, lower uptake because many companies, for good reason, don't wish to re-establish all their tolerances, which they've been using for, for many, many years. Uh, CIE 2000, again, only my experience seems to be that it's used quite widely in the printing industry where there is a less uh, legacy of color measurement. It's been more process control in the past with uh, more dense autometry. So more recent use of color measurement means that uh, there is a, like a blank sheet. So uh, you can use the, the latest, greatest color equation without any uh, fear or hindrance from uh, either supply chain uh, or legacy data. Oh, okay. So uh, this is where we could go on for the rest of the day talking about where sh I should set my tolerance. Uh, this is a question I get asked uh, almost all the time, especially when we do our fundamentals of color presentations. Uh, is, is there an international standard on tolerancing? No, not that I'm aware of. I've, I've never come across, uh, across one. It will depend on the nature of what you're, you're producing, the shape, the size, the adjacent materials. Uh, are they, the two colors going to be touching directly? Are there gaps? And the one point we probably haven't mentioned here is what your customer will accept uh, at the end of uh, the supply chain. So yeah, there's many, many uh, things or, or uh, dimensions we have to, to consider when we're setting these values. Here's an automotive example. Um, for any of you from, from the automotive industry on the call, we'd, we'd know this uh, well. I say, look at all of these car pictures. We, we put a black line on each of the diagrams. Can you see the differences? Or is there any differences between the different parts, the wing and the, the uh, bumper, uh, the wing on the body panels? It could be, I'm guessing most of you would might see one or two, but you might be saying it might just be the shadow, uh, how it's cast on the car. If we take that line away, now you can see quite readily, especially in the bottom central uh, picture, I think that's probably the most uh, obvious one where there's quite a considerable color difference. If you go back and put the line back in, it's less easy to see. So if our components are separated by some other color uh, or some space, our tolerances don't necessarily have to be as tight. If these parts are in a car body going to be exactly together or in a garment going to be a sleeve against a, a body panel of a, a shirt or a jacket or something, uh, if they're going to be within some printed material where the colors are going to again be directly against one another, the tolerances therefore take on a much more critical dimension. I quite enjoy when we have a mixed group again in our seminars, uh, if we get people from the auto refinish um, industries and from the printing industry and then ask them what tolerances they work to. Sometimes we can have a magnitude of 10 difference. The auto refinish might work to a, a Delta ECMC of 0.2 or 0.3 whereas a printer might work to something that's more like three to five. Uh, each industry will look at each other in uh, horror or amusement, but I would say both are correct because they fit those particular criteria for the customer expectation from those products in terms of the nature of the product, where they will be seen, how they will be seen, uh, and et cetera. Okay, here we have two computer screens. Okay, they won't necessarily be seen against one another, but you can see the color difference in them. Would it be critical? If they're going to be seen like this, yes. If they're going to be seen further apart, obviously uh, not. Actually, that's car, car rear view mirrors, I apologize. Uh, I have seen one similar, which is computer monitor stuck side by side. So unless you have two rear view mirrors in your car, then the Delta E might be slightly less critical. Obviously, there's also a difference between the back side of it and the, the front edging. So that would be a more critical color difference there. 
okay, we change the light source and we see, wow, there is a very big difference between the front and the back panels now. So uh, although we wouldn't see both of those mirror components together, we would certainly see the difference between the, the front and the back uh, components there, which obviously going to give the impression to the customer probably of low quality uh, in terms of the overall product or um, yeah, just unacceptable uh, quality control. So if we look at a more slightly uh, three-dimensional uh, illustration here, here we have a color called Firecracker. Uh, and we have a light dark uh, and a red green and yellow blue, blue uh, dimensions to it. If we put a slight separation line in, we can probably tell there is a color difference. The degree of it or how critical it would be might be more difficult to uh, come to a, a firm conclusion on. But if we take that separator line out, we can see for sure that that light dark is really, really bad. Again, if we go back one. We would say it's not acceptable, but, uh, well, it's not a perfect match, but is it acceptable? Yes or no? Again, if we see them directly touching, that would be completely unacceptable. And uh, the blue probably isn't very acceptable either. So again, that just shows the context in which we look at color. If they're touching, much closer tolerance is required. If there's a slight uh, separation, we have a little bit more scope to play with. So here we have uh, the tolerance food chain, if you like, which I, I always say to customers when we're doing our training on our software products, when they ask me what the tolerance should be, I say, okay, you've got your customer requirements. You have a specification that might be sent down to you from a, a marketing company or branding or a design house. Um, where are they getting their tolerances from? Are they literate in color? Do they know, maybe they have heard from somebody who heard from another person who went to a seminar who, or maybe someone read a book, what a tolerance should be. But that is not necessarily going to be a good fit for every application in every industry. You then have within your product, how variable will that product be? If it's a, a dyeing, you have water and heat involved which are sometimes not so easily controlled. If you're in plastics, you have the heat and the molding. Um, in your paint, you maybe have the weighing, uh, the mixing, the drying, it's accelerated drying times, et cetera, all become variables within the process. We can obviously use instrumental color assessment to put a number to each variable within the production stage, which will allow us at the end of the day to be more informed about the the variation within our process, is it acceptable? Does it fall in line with the customer expectation? Is there anything we can do to improve our production? Maybe the equipment is a bit old or maybe the operators need better training um, or maybe we have to just go back to the end customer and say, okay, you've asked for a Delta E of one. Our production gives us a variable of 0.8. Really, we, we have that's going to be very difficult for us to achieve on every batch we do. Does the customer accept slightly more than one? In which case, we, are, we have a better uh, ability to meet your uh, expectation. Or maybe we have to improve our production uh, variables so we have a delta of 0.5. Okay, 0.5 to one, we have, we have a better variable there. And obviously, the instrument, at the end of the day, the instrument we use to measure the color. Is there a variation there? We can again assess all of these and build a better picture which allows us to build a better to tolerance within that so talking about the uh, the different solutions um, touching on the instruments there there are different instruments for different types of uh, production uh, based on either uh, where they need to be in the factory or do they need to be uh, uh, transportable between customer and the production plant. Uh, what is the nature of the product? So for example, here, here are some of the X-ray instruments. If we work from the left-hand side, we have the benchtop sphere instrument, very uh, sphere-based technology used very commonly within the textile paint plastics industries. Benchtop instruments will obviously give uh, more uh, a higher specification. They're more stable. 
Uh, all the optics are bolted onto optical benches, so much more stable, repeatable, a uh, number of much greater flexibility in terms of uh, aperture size available. Uh, you can do transmission measurement for um, translucent plastics uh, or for liquids. Uh, quite often these days, we are asked to, uh, to measure things, uh, fruit juice, alcohol, uh, different uh, so maybe effluent solutions from uh, uh, washing or from dye house effluent, things like that. All a benchtop instrument would give us all the capability there. A number of different instruments within uh, the benchtop ranges, again with varying price points. Then a, a customer might want to use a sphere type instrument, but Okay, the uh, repeatability uh, might be slightly lower, but they want the flexibility to be able to take that instrument out to a customer site to do if a customer is arguing that uh, uh, some uh, production pieces come in and the um, it's not within their perceived specification, instead of having to go to the, uh, the expense of recalling that piece, someone can go out with a spectrophotometer and measure on site and see whether it is uh, a genuine problem or maybe just uh, uh, an, an inaccurate expectation on behalf of the customer. Um, we have uh, spoken to many customers uh, in recent times who have products, for example, uh, architectural products, which would be very expensive to recall and check and find that maybe uh, a piece has just been uh, positioned wrongly and there was maybe a texture effect on it, which made it look uh, wrong uh, in, in place. For example, uh, roof tiles or ceiling tiles, uh, sometimes they have quite a significant color change based on the texture of them. So they need to be fitted in a particular direction. So they always look matching. That can be easily checked on site using a handheld instrument. Uh, which will have onboard software, but also can link uh, into a, a PC-based software, so you can bring it back to base, plug it in, download the data, and then do much more sophisticated uh, analysis on the PC. Or, as you can see here, you can get a very simple pass-fail um, tick or cross, and uh, some LEB uh, delta E values on the instrument itself. Then we move to our MAT, multi-angle spectrophotometer, used for metallics, for automotive refinishes, anything where you have a, a color change with angle dependency, uh, you could use a, a multi-angle spectrophotometer. They, we sell them in three, five, six, or 12 uh, angle uh, configuration, depending on the uh, uh, requirements. And finally, a um, new instrument for us, uh, the MetaView on the right side, non-contact 45 degree uh, spectrophotometer, which is uh, essentially an imaging spectrophotometer. This uh, measures in a slightly different way to traditional spectros where we would shine light into an integrating sphere onto a sample and recall what comes back, or to shine the light at say a 45 degree angle onto the sample and measure at zero degree. What the MetaView does is uh, basically takes a very high resolution photograph of the, uh, the sample, analyzes uh, that data to create a spectral reflectance curve, which can then be manipulated using uh, C-Lab, CMC, Delta E2000, and various other color metrics. Uh, the the great uh, benefit of this type of technology is we can, instead of having fixed aperture sizes, we can zoom from a, a, a 12 millimeter down to a two millimeter spot and move the spot around the sample to, to pick up the, the best area of a sample drawdown or a textile sample, or maybe a, a particular color within a printed image. Uh, today, we sell that a lot with uh, retail paint solutions for DIY stores but are also selling it to companies that are doing uh, things like marbleized worktops or flooring, uh, wooden finishes where we need to, to zoom in on very critical areas of the color. All will offer slightly different uh, solutions, but will present uh, the data to allow us to uh, work with the, the different color equations and set our, our, our tolerances. 
um, as I've said before, based on our, our industry expectations. There is software packages, obviously, to go with all of these. Uh, Color iMatch, which allows us to do quality control, formulation, and uh, correction, which will link with the sphere-based spectro uh, benchtop spectrophotometers, the portable sphere-based, and the MetaView uh, spectros. There are a couple of other um, portable spectros that are uh, the exact, for example, which is used primarily in the printing industry which again can work with the, the Color iMatch or the Color IQC software. Again, uh, the Color IQC, unlike what it says here, is matching software. Uh, it should actually be quality control software. It is the quality control element of the Color iMatch software. Um, so a customer or a company can start with IQC to do color pass fail. And at a later point, if they decide that their, uh, their application would fit doing their own in-house color matching from their uh, supplied uh, colorants, they can then upgrade to the color eye match. There is also a net profiler tool which allows companies which have multiple instruments either internally or within a supply chain to uh, profile these instruments so that they give an even greater inter-instrument agreement so that there's a, a better chance to uh, shared digital data. So you can measure a standard, uh, let's say, in the Far East, uh, in, in, in a production area, may, a plant maybe in China, that can then be electronically uh, emailed or, or sent or shared within uh, shared uh, files on an uh, internet to, uh, let's say, a specifier maybe somewhere in mainland in Europe uh, or the US. Uh, and they can manipulate that data as if they were measured it directly in their own laboratory. So um, all of these tools will allow us, uh, or will allow us to do digital color uh, tolerancing, color communication, but also help us improve that. And obviously, for I think I can't remember back to the first question. Maybe it was eight percent of you were still only maybe doing visual color assessment. We have uh, from x right point of view, we have the Spectralite QC and the Spectralite Judge QC light booths which allow us to do the visual assessment under a whole range of uh, light sources, uh, D65, TL84, cool white fluorescent, with and without UV, which is obviously very important for textile users. Um, and this can be used either standalone or can be used in conjunction with the instrumentation so that we get the benefit of the, the visual assessment as well as the numeric assessment quite conscious that I'm, uh, we're getting quite on in the, the hour's presentation, uh, so we'll leave uh, enough time for, for some of your questions. So, um, maybe you answered this question uh, as part of the first question, but are you currently, uh, currently using uh, controlled lighting, either as part of your QC procedure or internally within your laboratories or your factory? All right, thanks, Colleen. I'm launching the poll. Okay, let's wait a few seconds. All right. Okay, easy question to answer. Seems like everybody answered. I'm gonna close it and comment the results. So I'm sharing the result, and we have 95% of yes. Uh, that, that is an answer that makes me very happy, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, very good. And for the other 5%, OK, thank you. Uh, for the other 5%, I would strongly suggest that you, you consider youth, um, introducing controlled lighting. Um, many uh, companies will do that through like buying a light box. Some will uh, go slightly grander scale. For example, the automotive industry will have color harmony rooms, which are uh, really a large room, or a, which basically the room becomes a light box and into which uh, you drive the car and you can do all the, the color visual color checks um, within that room. Uh, 
And just as a final slide of the presentation, um, XRite does also offer um, a seminar, a fundamental seminar, fundamental was fundamentals of colour and appearance, of which really I, I have taken um, pretty much today's uh, presentation is uh, a section of that, uh, where we talk about what is colour, how we see colour, um, so that we understand our own limitations, how we introduce uh, controlled lighting and all the uh, elements of that and the considerations, and then through the colour equations, far more detail on uh, all these different colour formulas uh, and how we should implement them and, of course, how we should set up uh, tolerancing or the, what we should think about when we, we set up tolerancing. And there's also a fundamentals of instrumentation uh, seminar, which takes that onto another stage, purely talking about use of instrumental uh, colour control. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that has been uh, of interest to you all and uh, maybe uh, raised uh, some questions in your own minds to go away and uh, review your, uh, your current setup or maybe uh, even just uh, confirmed that maybe what you're already doing is, is, is on right, the right track. Uh, hopefully some of you might have uh, sent in some questions to Jessica while we were talking. So I will... Uh, Wait to see if I can answer uh, any of those. All right. Thank you very much, Colin. So, yes, we're going to begin the uh, Q&A session. So, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions panel in your uh, attendee control panel. So, please don't hesitate uh, type in your question. We do have some. So, first question is, how do we assess color appearance in LED lighting illuminance? CIE have not yet standardized. Um, well, we ha we have introduced our IQC 10 software only a couple of weeks ago, and we have a whole range of, L as I understand it, LED sources uh, within that uh, package um, for that very very reason, because it is becoming uh, far more requested. Uh, even uh, a lot of the uh, laboratories and, and offices I go into these days are now LED light. Uh, uh, set up. Um, so yeah, I'm not not entirely sure. Uh, I thought the CIE had started to uh, um, what's what I'm looking for uh, to publish some of these uh, LEDs, but um, that's something I need to go away and check for sure. All right, another question, uh, a bit technical. Um, could you please give more detail why the human eye is ellipsoid tolerance shape? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know the actual biological reasons for it. Uh, it will be down to some of how the, the brain uh, sort of interpolates the information that comes from our rods and cones. Um, how it was discovered was uh, an American scientist called McAdam in the 1940s basically got a whole range of pairs of samples uh, and mixed them all up and got people who were not trained in color assessment to pair them up. Once they'd done that, he then plotted the coordinates of all these samples and he came to the realization that we um, toleranced visually elliptically. Um, yeah, that's probably more of a historical explanation rather than a, uh, a scientific explanation. Um, I would probably need to go away and uh, try and find some reference in uh, one of the many textbooks which are available um, to, to find some more details on that. So uh, I can have a look and uh, see if I can discover anything. Maybe it could be if you can find McAdam's paper from around about 1942 probably uh, that might contain uh, an, ex uh, an answer to your question. Uh, I will need to try and dig it out myself, to be honest. Okay, Colin. Um, next question. What is your plan to add LED module in exact? Um, you mentioned exact earlier, part of the instrumentation. So 
here's a question. Okay, we need to get back to you on that. Uh, obviously, as these um, new illuminants are uh, and new color equations do become standardized, uh, our firmware and all our, our instruments and our software platforms do get updated. Um, I don't know personally what the schedule is for the exact. Um, for anyone using our CI6 Spectra, I know there is a firmware update planned for later in the year, which I guess would include the uh, LEDs, but the exact uh, works to a different time scale. So I would, I would need to check that and we can let you know. Okay, uh, next question. What's the expected delta E difference between exact and I1 as these are different instruments? Uh, <laughs> it'll be nice when I get a question I can actually give a, um, a definitive answer for. Um, because they're different instruments, they're probably not particularly close, but again, that's something um, we could um, ask the question of our uh, instrument product managers and get back to you on. All right. Um... Colleen, what, what would you suggest if we get color match visually, but delta E is more than 2.5? Um, well, if, if they are visually um, passing, um, 2.5 is obviously okay. Um, I think that's the end. The rule of thumb I normally use with people is if you... If you visually assess, um, pass a color, then the numbers you get should be right. Um, as I said before, the tolerance, the numbers for someone to say one is is a pass across all industries is, is completely wrong because for some industries, uh, like 2.5 would be fine. Um, so yeah, if you are visually okay with that color, then that number is okay to go forward with. Um, I've always told people if they get a dis disagreement, if they get a number on a, in a, the mathematics that says pass and they visually fail it, I would always say go with what your eye tells you. So equally the other way, um, if the eye says pass, whatever the number that comes up, I, I would say probably that is good to go with. Um, there is a certain amount you would probably have to go back in check over a number of different colors that that held for all of the colors or repeat batches of the same color uh, just to make sure that that you know that particular day wasn't a, a day where you were maybe being a little bit more uh, forgiving in your visual assessment than another day and what conditions you were checking the color under um, so i wouldn't necessarily just say okay 2.5 is fine we'll go with i'll do some checking to make sure that you are comfortable uh, that that number would be okay um, across um, either across all products or across uh, um, specific products. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, um, next question. Sometimes the CIE 2000 result is shown in the tolerance label like 1.6 delta E but we're seeing a huge shade variation by eye under light box. So how to solve that? My CI, CIE 2000 ratio is one, one, one. Okay, sorry, say that. So you, you're you getting 1.6 and Delta E 2000. What, what did you say the shade variation was that? Um, sorry, could you repeat it? Sure, uh, that's correct about the 1.6 Delta E. We are seeing a huge Shade variation by eye under light box. How to solve that? Okay, are you checking? I mean, the, the first question I would say then, are you checking for metamorphism? Um, is it, are you looking at under different light sources? Because obviously, if you have it set uh, with all color difference equations, and this is, is not just CIE 2000, before all of them, many people will just do a test under the first light, which might be D65 or D50. Um, or, or, or a fluorescent source, and they'll get a pass. But obviously, if that color is metameric, it would appear there'll be a shade variation uh, under different lighting conditions. So really, 
you either have to set your pass fail under more than one light source or include your metameric index as part of the numeric uh, color assessment. Uh, again, I can only speak for the X-Rite software, but in our IQC, we can have your, your Delta E under whatever um, formula with the, the LAB or the LCH, uh, but you can also include things like metamerism index, opacity, uh, and various very uh, other color indices. But metamerism is probably a very important one to check. Okay, Colin, I think, uh, so this person is adding a comment. It's actually the same light, but the delta is under two, but they're seeing shade variation. Uh, which suggests the delta E2 is probably too high then if it's a pass or, or if it's set to say that two is a pass. If they're seeing shade variation, they probably have to uh, uh, tighten up that tolerance. Okay, um, we have two minutes left. Uh, important question, where can I get guidance on changing from LAB to LCH and is it possible to run color iMatch software using both? Um, you can get both in uh, the Color iMatch software. Where to get more information on it, uh, I am guess, come along to one of our Fundamentals of Color courses. We'll talk all about these things. All right, next question. Given the elliptical nature we perceive color, should the delta A tolerance vary with chromacity? So grays have smaller tolerance than high chroma colors? It uh, depends on the equation you're using. If you're using the C-Lab equation, yes. If you're using uh, CMC or Delta E2000, because of the internal mathematics changing the shape and the size of the ellipses, the a single number tolerancing will work for the high chrom chromatic, uh, chr chromatic and the, the more neutral colors. All right, okay, we might have time for one last question. Um, what tolerance would you recommend on textured materials, for example, corrugated boxes? Should this have a tighter tolerance? Oh, um, again, I don't think there's a definitive answer to that. Um, it would depend what the final usage for the corrugated uh, uh, cardboard is, for example, or the, the, the product. If if it's a high-end product, then obviously the tolerances would need to be tighter than if it was in uh, just, let's say, mere packaging. Um, again, what, what is the expectation of the customer? Obviously, if there's a texture, the uh, maybe the orientation of or the color difference due to the orientation might be have to be taken into account. Obviously, when we measure things like textiles, where you have uh, the weave of the textile, we normally recommend that you take an average of a measurement at, say, zero degree and 90 degree. Uh, it might be that that for the corrugated material has to be considered as well. Um, and I guess a bit of experimentation to find out what numbers will fit with the customer expectation, as kind of we've been saying again and again uh, during the last hour. I, I think it will, uh, in the end of the day, the numbers will be determined by what the customer say, says they're happy with. Okay, thank you, Colin. That's the end of the webinar. We do have a couple of more questions, but we will answer them by email, no worries. Um, okay, so I'd like to thank Colin for this interesting webinar and everyone for attending today. So if you have any other questions, please contact us anytime. On behalf of X-Ray Pentone, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.